Hi, everyone. I'm Nora Shabazi, the founder of Ebly, Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction, and I am here today with David Chalk, um, who many of you are already familiar with. He, uh, about almost exactly a year ago, mm -hmm. he came down to Michigan from Vancouver, Canada for um, about a little less than a week of instruction that was being filmed for the document, the for the documentary, The Truth About Reading. So we just wanted to do kind of a one year um, update, see what's been going on in David's life. He did about five or six months ago, we, we kind of did an update. So this is our second one. So David, so happy to have you here. Um, could you just kind of give us an idea and some insights into what's been going on in your world, kind of from every direction since you were here in that experience a year ago? Well, thank you for having me, Nora. And I want to thank all the people who viewed the last interview we did, you know, tens of thousands of people. That was five months ago. And I do want to comment on that. Maybe we'll talk about that um, as well. But if anything, a year later, almost a year to the day of what my life was before and post coming to meet with you and, uh, and learning to read really for the first time, um, I could say a hundred things or a thousand things, but I think if anything, what would be most valuable to people listening, to support people of people that have either learning disabilities or literacy challenges is the peace that I live in now. And I think that is really what it's all about. Life throws a lot of challenges at us. And you know we work hard, we we plan, and we strategize for the future. Sometimes we we think far too much, but we go through life with stress and anxiety. And when your literacy is low, it only compounds it so much. So a lot of what you do or what you do is you help people um, reinvent to or, and for adults to reinvent and for children to come up through the system with literacy skills that will have them be what we, you know, we call normal or better than normal but at the end of the day there's only one thing and that is how we live with ourselves how do we survive and cope and make it through every day and feel joy so if i'm answering your question a little bit of a roundabout way what has happened in that time i have found absolute peace in my existence, in everything that I do, so much so that I look forward to every day. Uh, I used to wake up, people find it hard to believe, I'd wake up every morning thinking, how am I gonna make it through this day? Mm. And I think in the last interview I told you when I was 40, I was diagnosed with you know, many um, challenges that caused my reading and my literacy to be low. And every morning I would wake up thinking, okay, I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to make it through this day. But that was my life. And I can honestly tell you, you know, th those thoughts never go through my mind. And I think if people could understand that supporting others in literacy isn't just about them reading, it is about life and enjoying it and, and being positive and then giving back, helping others. Yeah, I don't think there's really any greater gift than inner peace, actually. I hadn't even mm -hmm. been thinking about that one, but that's pretty amazing. Do you have any examples of specifics in your life, like things that have changed, whether it's around reading or your work or that type of thing? Is there anything that you can share with us about that? Yeah, I can. How could I best put it? I think it would tie in a way to the interview we did five months ago. I... When you asked me to do that interview, I, I didn't prepare for it. You asked me questions and I just spilled my guts, so to speak. And I'm glad I did. I needed to get that out. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't a strategy behind it. It was just I needed, to, I needed to release it from me. But in having done so, I realized that that was the last time I ever needed to do it. I, the last time I ever really needed to think about all the challenges in my life, the so-called story of my life. And I got to a point, you know, deep down inside of me now that that was a story and I accept it. It was my life. It gave me many wonderful advantages. Um, I still, I'm asked to speak a lot and I talk about it. But now I speak about it in past tense of lessons learned. It isn't me anymore. Um, even when I, when I discussed it with you last time, 
thinking about it, I was telling my life, but I was still a little bit attached to it, even though I had completed the reading. I, I didn't have the full gestation of coming through it. So now when I think about the challenges in my life, they're just a story. It's what was, which got me to where I am. And I feel so free of, you know, I think what we called that one was the hell that I went through. And millions of people go through that hell. But most people can never separate themselves from it. And I couldn't up to that point. I mean, I was 62 years old and I was still, I was working with it, but still living it. Now it is just something in my past. And the timing of my going down, the original timing was quite unique because I had just come to a point in my life where a number of things had happened. COVID was still uh, on. Um, many financial matters had gone wrong in my life due to COVID and my speaking career all being shut down. That I, about a week before coming down to you, or a couple of weeks before, it's the reason I accepted doing it. I, I made, I drew a line in the sand and said, I'm going to give myself a year to really turn my life around again, because, you know, I had been very successful and I had let it slip my own doing. And then I got the call that said, Hey, you know, would you like to be in a documentary and take this incredible program that would teach you literacy? And I jumped on it because that, that idea I had in my head that, okay, this is the start of one year. We're one year past that today, the six month mark, we did the interview at which I, flushed out everything in my life that I had lived with. And now this interview, one, one year after meeting with you, I'm not even the same person, Nora. I, you know, I've talked to you a few times about your projects and I think you can, you can see it in me. I'm excited about the documentary coming out, but I, I can't, I mean, I, I have a pretty good vocabulary, but I'm at a loss for words to say, the freedom, the inner peace, and the joy, that is what we have to give people. Your coaching and your training and your instruction and all the people that work with you and all the people that are working around that documentary, you're giving something incredible to the world. I thought I had a good life. I, I was successful in many ways, and I, I wish for everyone to be successful, but I never felt what it was like to be free of the pain. And my language skills in changing those. It wasn't so much just that I could now read. I mean, I'm reading three books simultaneously. I read every day and every morning now. I'd only read five books in my life prior to that. Now, I look forward to what I told you when we were, when we were in the middle of the training, that for the first time reading was something different. It was, I said, it was like watching a movie. I was in it. I wasn't struggling to decipher the words. And so now in my life, yes, I could give you a thousand things that have changed. Um, new companies I've set up, new coaching, clients, business models, um, you know, all, all the financial things in life have been done. I'm on track and you know, designing a new house to build and all of those things. But at the end of every day, I sit down and I just go, you know what? I love my life. And if we could give that to people, um, Literacy problems cause such great stress and such great worry that you're always wondering what's around the next corner. And with that gone, anything is possible now. Wow. I love my life. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Best phrase ever, I think. And I want to go back to something you said, too, as far as like you were still processing and, you know, that six months after and now again after. And I think that that's really important, even for children as well as adults but who have had low level literacy and then they don't, this has been my experience is that almost always your mindset of the learner lags a little bit behind your ability. So that was really interesting to hear you say that because I've heard that over and over again, like you still think you know, the past way you thought mm -hmm. until that process is in, right. and, and it happens over time. So I think that that's a, um, an important you know, piece of it too. So that's- well, I, I'm, I'm so glad we did that interview five, six months ago because it would never occur now. I could never go there. I could never tell that story. I could never relive that pain because I don't want to and I don't have to. Of course, I will share it with people to give them understanding. But if we hadn't done that one and it didn't exist out there on the internet, it would never happen because that is not my world. You know, step one was learning through you. Step two was processing it up to five or six months. 
And then step three, where I am now, I, I, I said, I love my life. <laughs> That's just so awesome. Mm -hmm. I do want you also to talk, as you know, obviously, you and I went down to New Orleans um, back in, I don't know, January, February, mm -hmm. and presented at the Plain Talk conference down there. And, you know, you had not been around the literacy world before that. You're definitely- I hid from it. <laughs> marinating in this whole amazing mm -hmm. group of literacy people. So, um, and we talked about your, your story and your experience and all of that. And I'm wondering if you can talk about you know, not necessarily our presentation, which you're such a phenomenal presenter, but about your experience around that whole conference and all of that. I know you also were refilmed again, uh, re-interviewed for the, the documentary. Mm -hmm. So if you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, it was it was wonderful to attend that um, conference. It was a life changer for me as well, too, because as I said, you know, seriously, I hid from the education and, and literacy world. And to go down and be a presenter with you on stage in front of hundreds of people and thousands of people attending the conference just post COVID, first time people were really back together to see a room with 2000 people in it. It was, it was a whole new, you know, scape of, of, of understanding. But what I found incredible was the, even then the change in my being, the change in my presence, just being present to the people that were there and sharing what I could in a way to excite people about possibility for others, to give them compassion and caring for all those they have to support and the value in doing it and bringing it through. And then after the you know, after we did the talk, to be there for a few days and seriously have hundreds and hundreds of people come up to me. You know, I've done many talks and people come up to me at the end of the talk. But for days and days of people just stopping me saying, David, you know, uh, I want to talk to you further. You know, you, you need to talk to so-and-so. You can help these people. Well, I can't help them. You can help them. What I can do is that I, I can encourage them. And that's what I felt I did. And the feedback and the reward I got for sharing that was so overwhelming. And I've, I've stayed in contact with people because of it. I've, you know, I've shared experiences and I think it was really a catalyst for where I am now uh, to, to see the power that we have inside of us to, to generate for other people. And, what I'm seeing happen out there now with the people I've stayed in touch with is absolutely wonderful things. So for me, it was, it was a chance to feel whole That's by awesome. going there. There's two things I want to um, have you elaborate on. And one of them, I hadn't talked to you ahead of time. So tell me if you don't want to, that's fine too. But one of these, after your last interview in December, when we talked, you had somebody who reached out to you, a professional who was a struggling reader and you had been interacting with her and then on a whim kind of i think like the day before you went to new orleans invited her to come to new orleans do you want to speak to that at all obviously without using her name or sure, whatever yeah. i think it's going to be pretty popular uh, i do think she's going to be part of the documentary but yeah oh, well yes it was a person of many who had contacted me um by watching the last interview we did and she was said she was very moved by it and with all people that contact me through it they're quite shocked when i follow up with them because i'm truly committed to helping people she had to told me a little bit about her life and how she was a corporate executive and in similar to me had been very successful in business but she was an executive in companies and i was owner of companies so as much as my pain um caused me grief her challenges caused her more grief because she had superiors she had to report to. And it was very stressful for her. And we shared a number of conversations via Zoom before the conference. And on a whim, I said to her, you need to meet someone, Nora, you. I said, why don't you just hop on a plane, do the kind of thing I do, and just be bold and fly down there and then introduce you to Nora. And um, we, we met up down there. We had great conversations. I do believe you're still in touch with her. I haven't spoken to her recently, but I think it would it is a life-changing experience for her too. And if she's going to be in the documentary, I think it'll be exciting for people to see because here was a person that has struggled her whole life. No one had known about it. She kept it completely secret in her work environment and in her home environment, was bold enough to step forward and talk to me, the first adult she had ever spoken to. 
And in fact, she was the first adult I had ever spoken to about these matters privately, about how we felt about things. And it touched me in such a way that I thought having her fly down and meet you would be a change in her life. And last time we spoke, she said it had changed everything in her life. Yeah, she actually flew up here to Michigan too. So we've had a whole kind of around, you know, uh, what happens. type of thing. Now, and I am going to share too that um, <clears throat> what we're saying as far as the documentary, when David went in to be, get his post, you know, his, his interview after, you know, several months after being taught that, because we did a lot of uh, interviews at the, at, at Plain Talk, but she was with him and the director, Nick said, hey, why don't you let us interview you? Now, at that point, I think she'd only told three people ever about her struggles and she sat down in front of the camera crew and Nick and shared her story still waiting to see if you know if she feels comfortable enough for that to, it's hard to be used in the mm -hmm. um in the documentary or not but I mean that whole thing was just like this surreal like whoa kind it of was thing. meant to be as the yeah, universe yeah. just plays out when it's there's always a mission behind helping people and when you line things up that way they come for the good yeah, it was just really pretty profound mm -hmm. for sure. The other thing I just want you to share if you're open to is you're, you're, you know, sitting at the bar having a drink with and talking to the, <laughs> I don't know, the Harley guy next to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that is, uh, that was an incredible story. There's many parts to it and I'll share one or two of them. But um, what I had found with me that I'm not introverted, but due to my low self-esteem and my lack of self-confidence, even though I was professionally able to do things, I wouldn't talk to people. I wouldn't go up to people. And due to some circumstances early in my life, um, created some fear around things. I was reluctant to, to talk to certain people. On the last night or the night before the last night, the conference in New Orleans, I went to the bar for a drink just to relax. And there was a Another gentleman at the bar, we were the only two in there, but he was, uh, he was a biker, like a Hells Angel guy. And I remember thinking, you know, the old David would never just get up and talk to this person, but you know what? I'm going to change everything. It was part of my transition. I'm just going to go talk to them because who knows, something interesting could come out of it. And I'd like to know more about him. And I think he'd find it interesting why I'm here. Anyway, long story short, we sit down talking. And he, after we're talking, he turns to me and goes, so you're that guy. And it was sort of like, damn it. I'm down here with my wife and she's going to this conference and I'm trying to spend some time. And he was a super nice guy. We, we hit it off great. And he goes, I am so sick and tired of hearing about some guy that was giving a talk with another woman that blew everyone away that she cannot stop going on about how lives can be changed by literacy. He goes, he goes, now I'm sitting here talking to that guy. She's not going to believe it. I'd go up there and wake her up, but she'd probably kick me out of the room if I did. And it was absolutely hilarious. He, because for the last day, all he'd been hearing about, not about me so much, but about this new found way, this teacher had heard about of reforming reading in the education system. And it just made this incredible bonding between him and I, it's such a great conversation starter, but it, it just floored me that she had <laughs> spoken about it so much to him that he had it ingrained in his head. I thought he was gonna reach across and punch me, but if anything, he was gonna hug me because he just said, you know, you've helped her so much as well too, because she feels so good about what she does for a living now in teaching. Which is so amazing. Didn't he ask you to sign the um, a napkin because yeah. he didn't believe you that? You yeah, really, he wanted he had me sign a note was and autograph it so that she would believe that he actually had a drink with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. I wish him the best if he ever sees those videos. A great guy <laughs> from Cincinnati. Yeah, that was that was a really fun story for sure. Now, the other thing now, I know that you have been approached by different th people and obviously in organizations, even at a dyslexia association about um, you know, helping them out. Do you want to share anything about, about that? Yeah, it, it is wonderful. So many organizations and people have reached out to me to either be spokesperson for them or represent or give talks. And I take everything into consideration. There was one situation in particular that, I mean, of course it was good because I had a great conversation, but in the end, it was a little disappointing because I saw the system that you deal with, Nora. The, the overlying financial, um, political, and indoctrinated way of being, because this particular organization was very interested in the 
um, speaking on their behalf. But I had uh, found in conversation that they were very aligned with another way of teaching. And it is not a way that dyslexics can actually uh, learn to read because I am one. It's the Orton Gillingham system. And I had tried it and it didn't work for me. And yes, it, there's value in it for some people, but um, I know what works. Look what happened to me in a week and then a year from later, my entire life changed, 62 years old, and I tried many things, nothing worked. But what happened was I said, yes, I would be interested, but I would have to have a deeper understanding of how tied or your relationship with this other methodology of, of teaching literacy, because I'm here to show the benefit and to give people hope about the future, not so much whether they continue trying to learn in a system that isn't working for them. And in fact, um, at the end of the day, I have to say it didn't go well because they were so hardcore locked on the chairman of that particular organization, I think literally wanted to tear a strip off me for how dare I discuss whether or not dyslexics learn one way or another. And I'm that dyslexic and I learned that way. And so, yes, not, not everything, not everything plays out the way you would hope, because I think I could have done a lot of good, but what it did show me is what you and thousands of other people that are trying to educate people are up against when the system is in place to profit, to, to keep things the way they are. Um, and it, it did open my eyes to saying, you know, I think where I can help best is just being present for people, hearing their stories and giving them hope that there's a future, not working in the financial side of it or not being tied to anything particular. But oops, my alarm going off. You have a duck in your... That's my... Well, it, actually, that's my phone. I, it oh. clocks like a duck when it goes up. <laughs> Makes me laugh each time. So Yeah, that is. That's a good... Uh... get too many calls now. Sure, but yeah, yeah, I think the moral of that story was that it gave me an insight to see that we can't just be what we want to be and help everyone we want to help without the constraints of the system around it. And it, as the documentary comes out and starts to be released, where you'll find me is out on that front side, just reminding people that there are many ways to change your life. And if you have that opportunity and if you can do it, the world is your oyster after that. True, true. Um, another thing I wanted to ask too, people in your world, in your day-to-day -day life or whatever, I'm wondering, I have a curiosity of, do, what do they now? I remember when you came in at Plain Talk. I'm like, I would not have recognized you if I passed you on the street. Mm -hmm. Your physical appearance, mm -hmm. the way you carry yourself. I mean, and people, you know, who had seen you in the documentary and stuff, all were saying that too, and or had no. I'm like, whoa, David. This is. I mean, it's you were you'd lost literally weight. Mm -hmm. You know, you, and the weight of the world was. It was. I think the weight of the world, right? Yeah, I was probably. I was feeling hunched. I, I was feeling disheveled. But I think just standing proud makes a big difference. And that's yeah. all I had to do. You, you totally look different physically. But I'm just wondering if people in your day to day life, if they if anybody has noticed any differences and if so, what those might be. Everyone. <laughs> I think I was embarrassed at first. I, I told you I was embarrassed and what I felt humiliated when I first saw myself in a couple of clips from the documentary about the level of reading and how hard it was for me. And then the improvement I saw over just a few days, but then I came to the realization, well, if that helps people, that is fine. Then when I saw myself prior to going to the conference and after that, I even thought I looked different, but it was, it was just the energy that, and the way I was presenting myself. Well, now in my life, I, I don't think I don't think as a person that hasn't commented on David, you're a different person. They don't know why. I haven't told a lot of oh, somebody really wants me there. Yeah, that, um, that, they're like, we're going to clap. That <laughs> and that's unusual. Um, that just the way I communicate with people, the the way I I, I look to help them, uh, I'll. I'll just pick up the phone and make the outbound phone calls, but just ask people how they're doing. I, I want to engage people uh, as I'm meeting with them. I'm, I'm more open to asking them how they are and how things are going for them. It's not that I want to pry. It's just before I was so caught up in my story in my head. Um, I didn't have any room for anything else. And once I lifted that away and once I knew that it wasn't reading and literacy that were holding me back, 
it was as if I got a new brain that was totally open to the world to communicate, just like the story of the person in the bar at the hotel. That was sort of the beginning of it. And now people are just dumbfounded when I say, OK, sure, let's work on that or let's try that idea or, you know, I'm open to meet up with you for dinner or lunch. Um, just the other day, I, I went into the bank um, to see my bank manager for something and out of my mouth came, you know, hey, Chris. Um, would you like to go to dinner sometime? <laughs> and not something in the last 30 years that I would have ever didn't want to bother, didn't have the energy, didn't want to do it, met up with him. We went to dinner and oh my God, the opportunities that came out of that far beyond anything. It just reinforces that when you are in a state of mind of openness to possibility to the world and you're not living inside of your story, everything opens up. And I just can't tell you, it's, it's, it's so different. That's really doggone exciting. Mm -hmm. I love, I just love hearing all of that and, and watching it, you know, interacting yeah. with you over time to just kind of see this beautiful, huge flower. Yeah, you saw the whole thing. You saw blooming. me at my meeting with you. I was at the bottom of the barrel. That's where I'd given myself a year to change my life. I, I didn't come up with what would happen if I didn't. I just committed <laughs> that I would. And now and here, here, are, here we are one year later. You said something to me a while back that I thought was interesting about your creativity. Obviously, you have been tremendously creative your whole mm -hmm. life. But will you just speak to that real quick? I'd forgotten about it, about how you are differently creatively. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps. I'm at a loss for words today. I feel like I'm <laughs> stumbling over all of my words. But I think awesome. if, if anything, when I was able to get out of my head, which people with learning disabilities, reading difficulties, literacy, we are always putting ourselves down. We are always negative about possibility. Now, I was fortunate that, you know, as I said in the other interview, my mom coached me through it and let me know that behind everything, there was a possibility. And I, I worked and I worked through it. But there was always a burden of life on me. Well, post everything I've been through with you, it is so different because my career now, I mentor people and I coach them in business typically, but also in their personal lives. It's about business, but how they manage their personal lives and business as well, too. And now when I am speaking to them and, you know, 99 percent on Zoom, I'm not caught up in me. Oh, I wish I could read that. If they sent me a document, I wouldn't want to read it. You know, I wonder what they're thinking. Do they know that I can't read all the crap that would go through my head? Now I am completely <laughs> present to the conversation. That doc is going to be shut down. I don't think I've ever had. I'm very problem. curious about the doc. Who the doc is? Maybe I'll answer it for you. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say hey. Yeah. Duck person. <laughs> I, I, I'm more present than I could ever be. So with my clients, they're asking me questions and they're looking for insights, and I'm literally hear, hearing what's coming out of my mouth and going, where the heck did that come from? I am creative. I can't believe that by being 100% present to what they need me for, not that I didn't always give all my energy. I can honestly tell you the ideas, the creativity. Sometimes I was even, my daughter Grace got me this, the theory of relativity. I mean, I understand it, Albert Einstein, right? But because I changed so much, she said, you know, Daddy, I think you need to read this book again, because even in here, it talks about creativity. Well, Einstein is famous for saying that he never thought about anything. He was just present to so like uh, the theory of relativity. He was walking in nature. He'd been trying to solve the theory of the universe for his whole life. And one day when he was totally present, he had the thought and it came to him. Well, now that's my life. I don't have to think about solving problems I just become present to them. And I know that sounds kind of woo woo, but yeah. when you can empty your brain of all the contamination and negativity and frustration and self-deprecation, you've got this amazing thing there that mm -hmm. is untapped. It's sitting in front of behind a mind that is trying to control you. And back there is creativity. And we very rarely get to tap into it because the mind and the ego are trying to tell us what we can't do. But once I started to remove that out of the way, I found creativity beyond my wildest belief I'm, that's part of why I said I love my life I, I just enjoy every day now that's so exciting and you're such a good example to all of us oh. me very much included about you know what that looks like and, and sounds like and I really really appreciate your candor too and you're just always so open and eloquent with what you share anything else that you would like everybody to know on your one year anniversary yeah uh, that I'm speaking from the truth that 
if you'd have asked me one year ago when you were guiding me on flights to read the signs in an mm -hmm. airport to get down to see you, to go through a documentary that I just, I, I, I just said, I'm going to do it no matter what, to come out the other side and go through this year. I don't think anything could have ever had me believe this possibility. And I think if there's anything to take away from this um, is Nora, the information you can share about me when you met me versus the interview I did six months ago, which was me still living my story, but coming out of it to where I am today. It's as if, I don't want to say it in the religious sense, but it's as if I was reborn mm -hmm. and everything is a possibility. And, you know, the next 30 to 40 years of plan living past a hundred is as exciting as my first half of life again. And that, that was never going to be the case any other way. And it is possible for all people, all adults that don't feel they can read properly or don't have proper literacy. And more than anything, it's possible for children in the education system to never go through the hell that I went through. Wow. Anything is possible. That's true. And I'll come to your hundredth birthday party. If you'll come to mine, you got it. <laughs> we got a lot of years of, a. Uh, my dad is 95, just had his birthday, wow. he lives by himself. So, and my grandmother was 97 when she uh, did pass away. Uh, but yeah, I think in this day and age, they say there are yeah. people on this planet that are going to live to 150. I'm hoping wow. 100 would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm now that I can read. Yeah. All vibrant and vital and still doing great. Yeah, I've got a lot of books to catch up on reading. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, you are our, and in, I know, and you know, too, that you are an inspiration to thousands, to tens of thousands so. of people and will continue to be. So I really appreciate you being so open to, you know, sharing from deep within your heart and soul. And I know and I, I'm, I'm truly here for anyone who wants to reach out to me. Um, I, I, I commit to helping any way I can. Well, that is awesome. And I know you'll be hearing from lots more people. Mm -hmm. So thank you much, thank David. You, we'll, we'll check again, maybe on your two-year anniversary. What the heck? We should make this a yes. annual event. <laughs> yes, you might find me in the, uh, the rocket heading off to new worlds of possibility. Uh, <laughs> you you of can possibility. do an interview from there. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, well, thank you so much, David. Okay. Have a great day. You too. Bye now. Bye.